This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are tuning in from remote locations, particularly those of you who may be deployed to areas in and near Syria, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and other parts of the Middle East. Thank you for your service and for making us part of your Newsweek. In just a moment, former 16-year congressman and presidential candidate, Mr. Dennis Kucinich, will be joining us. And we're going to find out whether the recent attacks in Paris have changed his views that ISIS poses no real threat to the United States and his claim that Congress must put on the brakes to prevent an out-and-out religious war. But before Mr. Kucinich joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Dennis John Kucinich was born in Cleveland, Ohio, the eldest of seven children. He earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Case Western Reserve University. His political career took flight in 1969 when he was elected to the Cleveland City Council and when he was in his early 20s. From here, he worked his way up to mayor of Cleveland in 1978. He subsequently served on the Ohio State Senate from 95 to 97 until he was elected to the United States House of Representatives, a position Kucinich held for 16 years. As congressman, Kucinich was known to be an extremely hard worker. And for his voting record on human rights, the environment, and economic issues affecting the middle and working classes, he was one of the few representatives to oppose the invasion into Iraq and has been a passionate advocate for universal health care. He's also known for introducing the articles of impeachment against Dick Cheney and George Bush. After stepping down from Congress in 2013, in a move that surprised many of his peers, Kucinich joined the Fox News Channel as a political analyst, where he has been a vocal opponent of U.S. intervention in the Middle East, something we'll hear more about in today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program former 16-year congressman, Mr. Dennis Kucinich. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you. Good afternoon. Now, you've been a longtime opponent of U.S. actions in the Middle East, going back to the invasion of Iraq, uh, and you've been quite vocal about the fact that ISIS poses no real threat to the United States or its allies. Have the recent attacks in France caused you to change your views in any way? Well, if, uh, if one uh, believes in cause and effect, and I do, one must go back to uh, the fact that Uh, The United States, along with Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, has had as a policy the overthrow of the Assad government and and providing help to any group that would participate in that, no matter how uh, um, adverse to U.S. interests those groups would be. The idea was that any price uh, should be paid to uh, defeat uh, President Assad in Syria. As a result, the United States... Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and uh, have been involved in an endeavor which has helped to fuel uh, the uh, or strengthen Al Qaeda, Al Nusra, and fuel the rise of ISIS. So we have to go back to a failed policy of interventionism, uh, which has brought a tremendous blowback, which continues to bring uh, problems uh, to the West. And, uh, and ask, maybe this is the time to start talking about ending the war against Syria, uh, developing uh, close ties with all those who are trying to end the war, and, uh, and to stop these policies which ally us with uh, groups whose uh, purpose is inimical to the Constitution of the United States. Now, you've indicated that ISIS wants to draw the U.S. further into war because this helps them recruit by positioning the U.S. as the common enemy of Islamic worshipers. Uh, You've said that the deeper the U.S. gets involved, the more powerful ISIS becomes. Is that right? I think that's already been demonstrated. Uh, The the U.S. involvement uh, in Iraq helped to strengthen al-Qaeda, didn't weaken them. The U.S. involvement in Syria helped to fuel the rise of ISIS. It didn't uh, temper it. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a direct connection there. 
uh, the U.S. involvement in Libya helped to give rise to every variety of uh, radical jihadists. And so uh, every innocent person who we kill with our drone strikes and our bombing attacks uh, only fuels the rise of these uh, jihadists. So we have to ask ourselves, how does that benefit the United States of America? Do we think that we can continue to uh, roam the world looking for dragons to slay without in some way it coming back to the United States or to other places in the West? This is really a time to do some serious reflection on the uh, on the effects of our interventions. And that's what I've been advocating from the time when I first got into Congress and uh, and when I advocated, when I uh, challenged the Bush administration's march towards war in Iraq, when I challenged the Obama administration's uh, war against Libya. Uh, the United States uh, continues to pursue a wrong-headed foreign policy which endangers this country, does not make it stronger, which has uh, um, deeply added to the national debt, and which continues to separate us from uh, the resolution of so many of these conflicts. So you're saying that we're becoming a unifying force, a propaganda victory for ISIS and al-Qaeda and other factions. Well, I'm saying that that's one of the outcomes, just one of the many outcomes, Mm -hmm. that are adverse to the impact of the American people because we uh, we uh, intervened in the first place. I mean, look who you know who helped to create Osama bin Laden with uh, helping to finance the uh, a, a attacks in Afghanistan uh, with the intention of of usurping the role of uh, the then Soviet Union. Uh, you know, who helped to uh, uh, to continue uh, the uh, strengthening of Al Qaeda with these endless attacks in Iraq? Uh, and, and the war, which did, you know, al-Qaeda didn't have a presence in Iraq. Once the U.S. went in there, uh, suspended the Iraq government and essentially nullified it, there was a vacuum created. And, I, and al-Qaeda filled it, uh, just as uh, the black flag of al-Qaeda went up over the municipal building in Benghazi when the U.S. Uh, helped uh, lead an effort to topple the Gaddafi government. I mean, we have helped create this, and, and we really need a critical analysis of our uh, international uh, policies of our policy of militarization of the of the State Department, so that we can come to a resolution about how we work towards peace. Is peace possible? You bet it is, but not with a wrong-headed approach, which has some twisted idea that somehow we can determine who the leaders of other countries are going to be, and and not have any consequences for the for the for when we intervene and how many people we kill. Well, what do you say to folks who make a comparison to Nazi Germany and claim that we either stop the spread of ISIS in the Middle East or one day we face a much more powerful enemy on our own soil? I mean, is this a case where we either put down the enemy now or face them later? Well, let's look at, you know, what happened in Nazi Germany. I mean, the United States, you know, which was late in in getting in to challenge the Nazis, uh, understood uh, that, you know, if you look at the map of the world and how uh, Germany had invaded uh, so many different countries, yes. it, Germany, was in, Germany was a nation state. They, they didn't have uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the structure that an ISIS has. Yes. Uh, ISIS, ISIS is not a nation. ISIS is a disparate group. Uh, ISIS can and, can and should be dealt with uh, through a serious uh, 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 covert and overt international police action, but to put, but to for, but to elevate them to a level of a state is not only historically uh, th- does violence to the uh, historical comparisons, but it also minimizes our hope of being able to uh, confine and eventually uh, move ISIS out of the picture. You have to draw up their sources of funding. You, you have to get. Saudi Arabia to stop uh, playing uh, two ends against the middle here. You, you, we have to make sure that Qatar doesn't weigh in and provide money. You know, Qatar helped to finance what happened in Syria mightily. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that financing trail in just a moment. We have to take our first break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. You're listening to the Costa Report.
If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars. And today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli, who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 2006, my father, his brother and uncle were really playing with the idea of planting a vineyard. And planting a vineyard turned into making a bottle, turned into making sparkling wine when um, Michelle came into the picture. So it was really kind of an organic situation, us being in agriculture in the Salinas Valley, and then the extension of that went to grapes, and here we are today. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where one bottle is never enough. People say puffiness and bags under the eyes are the hardest things to get rid of until now. Introducing GenuCell Stem Cell Therapy from Chamonix, specifically targeting eye puffiness and bags. Due to new technology, GenuCell is an incredibly powerful all-natural serum. And with its instant effects, it's guaranteed to show results in as little as 12 hours or your money back. Users saw results in only 12 hours with dramatic improvement in two weeks. A true Chamonix classic, GenuCell contains eight extra ingredients to significantly reduce the appearance of bags and puffiness. Plus, GenuCell uses patented plant stem cell technology to improve longevity and brilliant long-term results. Call now to try GenuCell risk-free, 800-442-3684. Say goodbye to puffiness and bags today. Call in the next 20 minutes and get the legendary Esotique face cream absolutely free just for trying GenuCell today. Chamonix, the best skin care, best results or your money back, no questions asked. 800-442-3684. Cash flows and money move. The Money Moves show is dedicated to delivering tips and tools to help you earn more, save more, and protect your hard-earned assets. Host Pamela Fugit hetrick interacts with her guests and callers every Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Recent topics have included what is going on locally with health insurance, tips to maximize your Social Security income, how do you build an emergency fund for your family, Medicare 101 tips, how do you choose and pay for home health care, and many other topics. So tune in, take notes, call and get answers to your financial questions from Pamela Fugit Hedrick on Money Moves Thursdays at 7 p.m. That's Money Moves Thursdays 7 p.m. on KSEO AM 1080 Santa Cruz and KOMY 1340 Watsonville and 104.1 on your FM dial. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former Congressman Dennis Kucinich. So let's talk a moment about what can be done to stop ISIS. In researching your recommendations, uh, at the top of the list is to stop the funding. And according to your estimates, every combat-ready soldier costs about $850,000 to $1 million a year. So there must be up to $100 billion flowing into, and that's billion with a B, flowing into ISIS and The money seems to be coming from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Kuwait. So if we know that, why not turn off the tap and just let the money run out? Well, that assumes that the United States uh, uh, has has interests that are separate 
from uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and in a small, to a small extent, Kuwait. Uh, we don't. Uh, the United States has, uh, according to recently declassified intelligence reports, uh, effectively have welcomed a, a Salafist principality in, in eastern Syria and, uh, and an al-Qaeda-controlled Islamic state in Syria and Iraq. And, you know, this, this is, it, it, it absolutely blows the mind when one considers that, you know, one day we're working with these groups to try to knock off Assad, and the next day we're bombing them. And uh, we, we have to understand that it's, it's uh, certain Gulf states uh, working with the U.S. and Turkey uh, uh, have, have helped to prop up uh, al-Qaeda, al-Nusra, and ISIS in their effort to topple Assad, and at the same time have, uh, while well, sanctions are, are being applied to the to innocent civilians in, in Syria, uh, the, uh, these groups have made it possible uh, for ISIS to be able to sell oil on the black market to help finance their, um, uh, their uh, activities. So, you know, this what, is, what does all this have to do with the United States of America? What does this have to do with the, the, the needs of the people of the United States? How does this contribute to our security? It does not. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I advocate a very clear-eyed, hard-nosed approach to, uh, to dealing with international uh, conflicts where we have to get what's going on and quit, quit playing a double game. And there's too many double games going on. Uh, for uh, Washington to be trusted about a path towards peace. But we've got all these sleeper cells now, Belgium, France, the United States. There's a lot of talk about sleeper cells in Florida right now that have become activated. What do we do about that? I mean, even the Pope has come forward and said, we're in a piecemeal war. I, I actually thought that he described it properly. It is a piecemeal war. Well, it is, but at the same time. Uh, you don't militarize your society. You strengthen the capacity of local uh, police in the communities to be able to keep an eye on what's happening. You, you, you share the intelligence that comes through. You, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, you don't start to uh, turn your society into a garrison. You, you have to, we have to be very careful that we don't, throw out all of our basic liberties, uh, well, at the same time, our very government abroad is helping to fuel the position of these jihadists. So we, you know, this, there's, there, it's a totally schizophrenic approach uh, towards dealing with the world, and we need, to, uh, we need to understand that, yes, we should protect ourselves, absolutely. We have a right to protect ourselves. Government has a duty to protect the people. But we better start asking some questions about how we got to this position. We better start asking some questions about uh, what what kind of security is it when we keep creating more and more enemies and then have to protect ourselves in more and more places. Well, we have the Kurds fighting in northern Iraq and Syria, also the Shiite militias. Uh, we, you know, we, we there are groups that are that we could support and fund. Uh, would you be opposed to that? Is is that too much intervention again? No, we have been we've been working with the Kurds. But sure, Kurds but should working. we support them further? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 as in ground uh, troop boots on the ground that uh, will offer training and additional support. Uh, not to mean the partitioning of Iraq. Mm-hmm. We need to, we need the Kurds to work with us, but the Kurds were incentivized to work with us because they're hoping to have their own. Uh, independent uh, country. Mm-hmm. Now, I understand that, but at the same time, we have to be very careful that uh, 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 and w- what we need is a thorough review of the Iraq War uh, and, and 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 an understanding of how that was a, an utter disaster politically and financially, and for the people of Iraq and for the soldiers in the United States. We need to look at what happened in Afghanistan. How we should have never stayed there. How uh, uh, look at how we got into uh, Libya and, and what we've done in Syria in playing with these very bad groups uh, that are now uh, going after us. Look, the United States needs to take a different role in the world as a nation among nations. We cannot pretend 
that we have the ability, the money, uh, we should not even have the interest to dominate uh, uh, the world, to determine who the leaders should be of different countries. And, you know, we, 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 if we are instrumental uh, inadvertently or directly in helping to fuel uh, the overthrow of governments, uh, then we, we need to ask some hard questions when the consequences uh, arrive, uh, whether or not uh, there's some responsibility there. And, you know, the U.S. is a very powerful nation. We can create war. We've proved that. I'd like to see the U.S. prove it can create peace uh, as, as effectively as we create war. Right. Yes, you've suggested that if we are truly committed to peace, we would have a Department of Peace in uh, alongside of the Department of Defense, and we would commit resources and experts toward avoiding war. Um, have you, has that idea gotten any traction? Uh, no, it's still ahead of the time, and I, and I will say that uh, the, 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 this isn't about establishing another federal bureaucracy. It's about making sure the president has at his disposal a range of options that are non-military. Uh, you know, our military can do whatever they're asked to do, but all too often we turn to the military to resolve things that ought to be resolved diplomatically or that should have been caught when the violence was percolating, and we seldom have done that. And so what I advocate is that the president have a, a, a team of advisors at a cabinet level who can assist him in finding a way to avoid a conflict. Because if we've learned anything in the, since 9-11 is that every conflict we've gotten into is mushroom and the cost of it has gone up. I'm so sorry, I'm but to... isn't that the role of the Department of State? Well, the Department of State effectively has had a militarized policy. The Department of State has not... Um, has not practiced diplomacy as much as they have uh, uh, joined uh, and joined to uh, uh, to encourage the use of military force. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a problem. It's a big problem. It so, is a problem. You know, I, I really like to see a, a different definition of the Department of State. They seem to be almost a department that's confused about their role in government. Well, they're not confused about the war. They, I, I'm not about their role. It's a war. The role has essentially been one which uh, uh, advances perceived U.S. interests and mistakenly has put us on a path to war again and again. Yes. And, you know, the president doesn't get any help from them when it comes to avoiding war. They, they help to lay the groundwork for the war. Yes. Well, we have to take another short break. When we come back, we're going to find out how the U.S. should deal with Russia's intervention in Syria. You're listening to the Costa Report. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. Hello, Charles Friedman here at Watsonville's Auto Row, where the way things used to be is the way things are. What do Watsonville Auto Center small town values mean for you? Let's ask Melvin Cooper, owner-operator of Chevrolet of Watsonville. And the reason the Watsonville Auto Center is such a value-added niche in our community is because we're the most established auto center in the Central Coast, and we all buy our vehicles from the same manufacturer for the same price points across the entire state of California. The thing that makes us unique in the Watsonville Auto Center is being that we're most established. We have very low overhead, which allows us to add additional savings onto our customers and pass on those savings to the the community, and that's how we've maintained and earned the right to be, for example, the number one Chevy dealer on the Monterey Bay. 
November is 0% financing month at Watsonville Auto Center. That's right, 0% up to 75 months on select new cars at each dealer. Don't wait. Take the short drive to the way things used to be and save big at Watsonville Auto Center just off Highway 1 at Main Street and Auto Center Drive. Hey guys, Will Durst here with a few choice words about immigration, which has become a key Republican issue. Yes, again. It's what those in the garden industry call a perennial. As predictable as fruit flies on the dumpster behind a produce store. Every election cycle, the GOP sucks up to its base of underemployed, low-information voters by blaming somebody else for their woes. Donald Trump dominated the early rounds of this competition by vowing to deport all 11 million undocumented residents of this country, which, according to immigration officials, would take 27 and a half years, just in time for Mila Kunis' 60th birthday. This is in addition to his wall, which he promises will be tremendous. Although exactly how the man plans to build a 30-foot-high, 1,952-mile-long wall on the Mexican border without using Mexican labor remains a mystery. Makes you think that Trump's catchphrase, Make America Great Again, might be shorthand for Make America White Again. But the big dispute right now is between those two rabid feral goat senators, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, who have attacked each other over past, present, and future statements, each claiming the other is soft on illegals. That's right, the sons of Cuban immigrants are arguing over who's more anti-immigrant. You can't make stuff up like this. In the Republican version of West Side Story, the sharks rumble with the sharks. And the race for the nomination might just come down to which of these two 44-year-old anchor babies is able to best convince the American people that they can get back all those fruit picket jobs we've dreamed of all our lives. Working outdoors, sleeping on the ground, just like camping, only different. For KSCO Radio, I'm Will Durst. <laughs> Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Dennis Kucinich. And before the break, we were talking about how the State Department has put the United States on the path to war rather than offer alternatives which might uh, avoid war. Now, a second solution that you've proposed for dealing with ISIS is to wage all-out cyber warfare uh, because it's clear ISIS is using the Internet to communicate with sleeper cells and also to recruit. Tell us a little about that. Well, if you look at uh, the reports coming out of Paris, it's, it's very clear that uh, ISIS has been using encrypted technology to be able to communicate uh, and coordinate. Uh, you know, you, if we use the uh, prodigious infrastructure that the United States has and the talent that we have on cyber warfare, it would be very difficult for them to communicate and coordinate. Mm-hmm. And thereby, we'd limit, we'd limit their, uh, their reach. Uh, you know, it's not as though we don't have any tools at all in dealing with this, except uh, there are those who prefer only bombs. And we've been using those bombs uh, liberally. And it, it, for some reason, ISIS seems to be, uh, get more powerful uh, because we're bombing them. And at the same time, we're uh, helping to find ways to finance them. So what we need is a coherent, unified approach to deal with uh, ISIS and all the other groups that would uh, visit terror on uh, civilian populations around the world. Uh, yesterday, uh, Russia offered a resolution uh, that would uh, uh, provide for the international community to be involved in, in going after ISIS. Uh, France is, is expected to follow. But the problem is that the underlying concerns of the United States and the Gulf states is to get rid of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, mm-hmm. because they believe he is the main uh, uh, obstacle to peace in Syria. I mean, what a, what a monstrous lie. Uh, we've seen jihadists from dozens of countries pour into uh, Syria, financed by every kind of, of uh, Gulf state interest. And, and we're saying, well, you know, this is Assad bringing this on. Are you kidding me? I mean, we need to, we need to get real about this. 
and stop lying to people about a resolution. So it's, you know, it's no question that Russia has moved into a vacuum and trying to uh, find a way to uh, end the war. And they realize that, uh, that having ISIS or Salafists or jihadists uh, sitting in power in Damascus is not in the interest of any free nation. And so, you know, the, uh, uh, the essential truth is that the United States has to stop playing a double game here and that we have to rally the world uh, in, a, in, in, in a new effort to, uh, uh, to, to create peace in Syria and to uh, uh, stop the funding of ISIS, to cut off their financial and military resources and their, and their oil revenues, and to uh, uh, try to knit uh, together the fabric of a society in that region, which has been torn asunder by a, a, a virulent type of politics, which is aimed at, uh, at dominating countries uh, far away instead of trying to find ways that they can uh, be viable for their own populations. Well, let's talk about Russia's involvement in Syria right now. What do you say to leaders who claim that any withdrawal at this time gives the wrong signal to Russia and the Assad regime? Any withdrawal of what? Any withdrawal of our troops or or slowing down the bombing, any backing off of our assault on ISIS? Well, there's not going to be any backing off because the U.S. is uh, is in this. My concern is that we we dry up ISIS uh, uh, sources of income. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that Russia is is not going to uh, be deterred from trying to protect uh, President Assad's position in Damascus. Yes, uh, they are not going to yield to the Gulf states who have tried to uh, usurp. Uh, the, um, uh, the the Assad government mm-hmm. in the interest of, of establishing a Salafist state in Damascus. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Russia's worried about some, has some of the same security concerns against uh, relating to these jihadists as, uh, as other countries in the region have. Mm-hmm. And so we, we really uh, have to understand that there's an opportunity here to work with Russia to, uh, if we, if we are serious about uh, targeting ISIS, and to uh, uh, and to do that without regard to um, uh, Assad's uh, departure. That there, you know, I I don't think that you can, you know, it was uh, the Russian foreign minister Lavrov has already said he don't want any preconditions set mm-hmm. on the Syrian uh, government's departure. So we have to look at uh, what's the goals here. What are our priorities? If the priority is to knock off the Assad government, we're going to see endless war. But if the priority is bring about peace in Syria, there's a there's a, a plan to do that that would and has to involve the Assad government that has to involve strengthening the constitution of Syria that gives uh, opposition right uh, uh, opposition interest an opportunity to be heard that enables uh, uh, people to stay in Syria instead of being scattered to the globe. Uh, there, you know, it's not as if none of this is in, all of this is impossible. It's quite possible. But there has to be a willingness to end the war. Yes, but our current policy seems to be that there can be no peace in Syria unless Assad steps down and ISIS is taken care of within Syria. That seems to be the policy. I just want to I want to make sure we keep one foot in reality. What's your reality? Put, put ISIS in charge of Damascus? Where you, I mean, what are you talking about? I, 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 what, what I'm saying is the current U.S. policy appears to be there cannot be peace in Syria without taking out ISIS and Assad. Yeah, well, well keep in mind that a vac- power vacuum in Damascus is going to, at this point, is going to be filled by uh, radical jihadists and, uh, and, and, all, and all the implications that means for the region with respect to uh, Sunnis and Shiites, with respect to I- Iran. Um, this, the U.S. has to stop playing this game. Uh, we, we should never have pursued uh, a, a, a path of cooperating with al-Qaeda, al-Nusra, and ISIS to knock off Assad. Mm-hmm. Assad re- has its problems, to be sure. I'm not defending them. What I am defending is the right of the people of Syria to live in a sectarian, uh, in a secular society. Mm-hmm. And that's what they had. 
and that's what they're trying to protect. But right now, uh, the U.S. has been backing interests that want to destroy that type of society, that simply want to enshrine a, a very uh, a radical fundamentalist approach towards one uh, sect of a religion assuming control of the politics of an area. Now, why is the United States doing that? I mean, why is my country involved in trying to knock off a government and, and putting in a, a, a very um, powerful a religious uh, uh, backed government with the intention of, of installing a, a regime that is fundamental and inimical to the interests of the United States. I will never understand that. I will never accept that. And I think that we have to continue to challenge the Obama administration's double game here of bombing ISIS one day and of helping them on the next day in, in their effort to knock off uh, President Assad. Mm-hmm. Well, I understand your position. I I wonder, are you in favor of the of establishing a no fly zone in Syria? No, I'm not in favor of of any uh, any advanced military uh, appro- approach that would uh, weaken the ability of the Syrian government to defend itself. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that does, and and again, what, what we have to understand is that. You don't, a no-fly zone doesn't end a conflict. It sets the stage for accelerating it. How do we end the conflict? Cut off ISIS's funding. Cut them off uh, in terms of the, uh, their cyber uh, infrastructure. Yes. Uh, stop them from getting oil revenue. Mm-hmm. Stop these Gulf states from playing a double game. Stop the United States from trying to overthrow a government which is resisting us. Yes, I understand. And, and, and I think all three of those... Uh, tactics would certainly have a major effect on uh, ISIS's ability to function. Now, we have to take our final break, but we'll be right back after these important messages from today's sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash bigdata today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. It's time. Time to kick off the holiday season with Think Local First 9th Annual Radio Eggnog Membership Meeting and Mixer, Thursday, 5 to 7, on KSEO's all-new Party Plaza. If you are a member of the locally owned business community, come dressed for the sunset. Enjoy free music from Dance Land, guided tours of KSEO's historic studios, a hosted microphone to tell the world about your business, tasty hors d'oeuvres from California Kuro Buddha and the affordable chef, wine from Bargetto's, 
beer from New Bohemia, sparkling ciders from Martinelli's, coffee from Mr. Toots, and eggnog from Staff of Life. Dress for the sunset and join your friends and neighbors for Think Local First, 9th Annual Radio Eggnog at KSEO, 2300 Portola Drive, Thursday, 5 to 7. It's time for fun. Hi everyone, it's Kay Swirling. You haven't heard a commentary from me in quite some time because I decided to rest my brain, smoke some pot, and mellow out. Just kidding. Besides, I'm sick and tired of all those weasels who will do anything, even run over their own grandmothers if necessary, to get elected president. But since I learned that KSEO is now available to Santa Cruz County on the FM radio dial at 104.1 FM, I am so excited that I cannot remain silent. So whether you listen on air or online at ksco.com or via our free iPhone and Android apps. We are and will continue to be your favorite radio station, KSCO Santa Cruz. We're listening. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Dennis Kucinich. Switching gears for a moment, I want to try to bring all of the consternation we're experiencing abroad back home, where, according to you, much of the responsibility uh, rests in the U.S. You were a very vocal opponent of the authorization to use military force, and you called it a wholesale appropriation of war powers, which essentially gave the Oval Office the power to act unilaterally in the Middle East without congressional approval or support. Can you speak to that for a moment? Help us understand that. The Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 8, requires that the Congress of the United States have to weigh in on any decision to take the country to war. And over a period of generations, uh, presidents have become more powerful by essentially usurping Congress's role. Uh, the authorization for the use of military force was written to provide a blank check to the executive branch. Mm-hmm. The Constitution never contemplated that. You know, when I warned in 2002, you know, 13 years ago, that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, with al-Qaeda's role in 9-11. Iraq did not have uh, uh, the intention or capability of attacking the United States, did not have uh, no evidence that they had weapons of mass destruction or were going to use against the U.S., those, those statements at that time were dismissed by those who were dedicated before 9-11 to taking us into a conflict in Iraq. I warned four years ago about getting into Libya and how it would result in, in deposing a government that is as noxious as it was, uh, withholding the lid on, uh, and, and, and a force of, uh, to stop an avalanche of jihadist activities in that region. And I warned the same thing about Syria, that, uh, that deposing Assad would only... Uh, embolden jihadists and break apart a, a, a government that, for all of its faults, uh, still promoted a secular society. So, look, I've been on top of this from the day that I got into Congress, and I can tell you that I, I remain continually concerned about the United States' role in the world, about how our policies undermine our security here at home, how they are adding and doubling the national debt, how they're robbing the future from our young people, and how America must yet take a new path in the world. We cannot be the policeman, and we sure should not be the provocateur. Well, I understand that. You've been doing this for years. As you point out, uh, you've pointed out there were was no evidence of mass dis- uh, weapons of mass destruction. You pointed out it was al-Qaeda and it was not the, uh, the Iraqi regime that was responsible for 9-11. What, what's stopping members of Congress, members of our government, from listening, from looking at the actual empirical data? That's a good question. Um, I, I would say that fear. Fear. Is what, fear. Fear drives our policies. Fear uh, is, uh, paralyzes. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, mental and spiritual faculties to be able to uh, resolve challenges. Fear uh, isolates us and, and causes us continually to make the wrong decisions. 
And, you know, if we remain the land of the, of the uh, free home of the brave, uh, we can call on, on our courage to help us meet our everyday uh, uh, challenges around the world. But we haven't been doing that. What we've been doing is giving into our fears and uh, grabbing for our arms and attacking uh, anywhere we well please without regard to the consequences. And it's time for America to take a different position. We just can't continue to do that and survive uh, as a nation and protect our freedoms. We need, we must take a new direction. And that's what I've been talking about from the time I stepped foot in Congress in uh, January of 1997 to the time that I left Congress in January of 2013. And I continue to do it as a private citizen today. You would think as things grow worse, uh, more people would be listening to you and saying, well, you know, I might not have agreed with you 10 years ago, five years ago, but, you know, you have a point. Uh, Things have grown worse. Um, I want to address this issue of fear. We now have many nations in a fear state after these coordinated attacks in Paris. And we seem to be now in this what I call 9-11 mentality. Right. right. That 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 all the people that are trying to leave Syria and leave other um, terrorist hubs in in the Middle East and go to Europe, come into the United States, uh, need to be uh, examined one by one very carefully. And uh, we can't open our borders and welcome them in. Um, it feels to me an awful lot like the response we had right after 9-11. Yeah, you're right. It, do- it does. Um, and. Uh, you go back to um, the days after 9-11, you know, there's a lot of fear. And look, fear sometimes is a natural and a healthy response to, uh, to circumstances. So, but, but we, we have to be mindful that fear can also paralyze cognition. And, you know, when, when uh, FDR faced a nation that was insecure uh, militarily and economically, he said we had nothing to fear but fear itself. And we have to realize that fear can cause us to make the wrong decisions. Think think in our own individual lives. All of us have done this. Where you'd make a decision uh, or or do something that was based on fear and it just ended up going wrong. Uh, Well, that happens in the affairs of nations as well. And so we, we really have to call on the innate courage that was instrumental in founding our nation. America wasn't founded by fearful people. It was founded by people who had a sense of destiny and vision and, and grit and gumption. And, and we cannot let ourselves be diminished by the fears which come around and which you know, can be challenging, uh, can be thought-provoking, uh, but are not a path to living every day. We, we, can, we, we have to, there is something about living fearlessly which enables us to be able to create the world we want instead of having our fears imprison us in, uh, into immobility or even worse, into reaction. Mm-hmm. And we do seem to be very reactionary uh, right now. Uh, I, I wonder, what caused the Congress, in your view, to believe the authorization to use military force was a good idea? Because in your estimation, this almost guarantees a permanent engagement in the Middle East. Well, let me just say, you know, the um, uh, the authorization for the use of military force occurred right after 9-11. And, I, yes. you know, everyone, is, you know, the only one who voted against it was Barbara Lee. I voted for it because I, I feel that you have to uh, defend the nation and you have to let the people of America know that you're going to defend the nation. Now, the way you defend the nation has to be calibrated and weighed. But that we had the right to, to strike at the, LK, uh, at the uh, uh, training camps. Uh, in Afghanistan, absolutely. But to l- linger in Afghanistan, to uh, invade it, no, that was wrong. Mm-hmm. But the authorization was used as a blank check. Yes. So when the president came back to uh, the Congress in uh, uh, October of 2002 for a war resolution against Iraq, uh, there was little or no debate on the underlying facts. There was plenty of information out there. Rebecca, I, I, anybody who cares to do it, uh, just Google Kucinich uh, Iraq War Resolution, and you'll see on October 2nd, 2002, I did a comprehensive analysis that stands up today about the reasons not to go to war. But the same kind of fear that, that uh, 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 caused the reaction to uh, 9-11 and, and, the, uh, and the ultimate uh, war in, uh, in Afghanistan and later on the war against Iraq 
prevailed uh, to take us into Iraq to keep us there, and frankly, it prevails today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, you know, instead of instead of reauthorizing the uh, uh, this authorization for the use of military force, it ought to be repealed. Congress has to take some responsibility here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, I want you to give your website one more time. We're almost out of time here. But I this program is dedicated to trying to get empirical facts out to the public uh, as opposed to interpret uh, things for them. So I'd like them to have an opportunity to know what your website is again. It's uh, Kucinich.com, K-U-C-I-N-I-C-H.com. Mm-hmm. And I think an empirical approach is, is, is urgently needed. It and is. We have to. We also need to study the laws of cause and effect. Every action has a reaction. Every every uh, a cause, uh, every everything we do produces effect. And so far, the laws of cause and effect seem to be suspended in Washington D.C. We think that we can do anything anywhere and not have it blow back on us or other or our allies abroad. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want America to take a more temperate approach on these things. Yes. And well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have left, Congressman. But before we say goodbye, let me take this opportunity to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you. My guest next week is the former commissioner of the New York City Department of Corrections, who in an ironic twist of fate became an inmate of the very prison system he once oversaw. Don't miss a riveting look at prison reform from the inside out with Bernard Carrick, right here on the only weekly news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Costa Report. 